Hi, my name is Brindley Collins Brooks, and I'm here with HS Connect. And today we are talking with Dr. Vivian Shee, um, who is a dermatologist locally right now in Arkansas, right? That's and you correct. just relocated there not too long ago. So yep. anyone in the area, if you need a good derm, check her out. Uh, she is definitely worth the trip, even if she's a little bit farther from you than you'd like to be. Um, today we are going to talk about atypical HS and um, Dr. She just did some research and uh, study on this and I wanted to hear more about that. Fill us in. Yeah, hi everyone. Greetings from Little Rock, Arkansas. So um, very honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Denise. Um, it's always been a pleasure to work with you folks in HS Connect and thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, so I guess we can start by, you know, saying what is atypical, right? What the heck is atypical? You gotta have a typical before you have an atypical. Um, and it's a term that we hear a lot, has a lot of stigma behind it too. So let's start with what's typical. You know, HS can affect any part of the body essentially that have a hair pore or hair follicle. Um, when I was a resident, I learned that the only parts that doesn't have hair coming out are the pink part of our lips and our palms and soles. And anywhere else is fair game for HS. That being said, there are more common areas that HS can develop and they're called the intertriginous area or I call them skin folds. Um, the most common area I would say um, in adults are kind of in the underarms, in women, especially kind of below the breast and in between the breast and in groin folds, um, kind of where the bikini area is. And that's common in both men and women. So that's all we have for the typical area. But any of you who have HS or have family members with HS will know, well, they don't just stay with those areas. They can occur anywhere. And I guess some of these quote unquote atypical areas can be anywhere from like the scalp, um, behind the ears, kind of on the neck folds, um, buttock in between the thighs, the crease of the buttock. And I even have many patients who have it on their arms and not even like the inside of the arms where there's friction over here. Like, you know, you don't see hair, but they can get HS there. So um, these, even though are the less common areas, um, they do happen. And I guess, Brandly, we talk about this a lot. You know, atypical is probably not the right word because it how do I say this as a practitioner and our partners can miss the common location. So perhaps we should call them intertriginous sites versus non intertriginous sites or like skinful sites versus non skinful sites to not dismiss the less common areas. I think that's a really good point. And it's, it's definitely something that we hear in the community all the time is that people say, um, you know, when they've seen a clinician that they can't have, it couldn't be HS because it isn't in the typical locations. Um, so I think that can definitely um, help people get diagnoses quicker. And then also being educated yourself as a patient um, will also help the clinician as well along the way to say, no, I know that this can develop elsewhere. Do, you know, if, if you're unsure, please look further into it that I'm pretty much guaranteed this is what I have based on all of my symptoms. So I think that there's definitely something that can be said for being a patient um, and being educated yourself. Totally. I mean, I think as a person living with HS, they will know their body better than anybody else. I would say the doctor doesn't know it any better. And so I always say that my patients are the experts. They are the best teachers. They know their body the best. And um, I think where clinicians run into trouble in misdiagnosing HS is focusing on the distribution of HS rather than the morphology or how the individual lesions look. Because you know, luckily or unluckily, HS has very classic morphology and lesions, and there's only a spectrum. And so even it occurs in kind of like an uncommon area, but if you have the classic like double blackheads or kind of the cigarette paper scars or when the, the, uh, the blackheads connect with each other with these very early tunnels, those don't lie. That is HS no matter where they are. Yes, please. Can you tell everyone in the community that's so that so that we can help move this along. <laughs> that is my full-time job, believe it or not. And we are making big strides day after day. And it's a big community of yes. practitioners. And little by little, we hope to penetrate them. <laughs> we hope to like, you know, disseminate our knowledge with you guys. Yes, definitely. We are making progress. Um, so tell us about the research that you uh, just completed and, and kind of how that plays into the atypical HS. 
Yeah, so um, I'm glad you bring that up. One of the interests we have, and this is kind of um, sparked by talking to experts like yourself and my own patients, is, well, how do I know where I'm going to first start having HS in my kids? Because um, my adult patients are really concerned, like, you know, my, my daughter is now 12 years old, for example, if I'm going to check for HS, where do I go? And it's also a lot of value when, um, you know, a, a teenager's first be seen by their pediatrician. They're not always doing a full skin check, but in folks who have a family history or have risk factors, for example, where should they really be looking? If there's like one or two places they should be looking instead of a full skin check, I want that to be like the highest yield for them to catch HS early. And that's what led to the research we did uh, in collaboration with Dr. Jennifer Schell at UCLA and um, one of my former students who's now a dermatology resident, Jennifer Fernandez. So we surveyed um, a bunch of people living with HS with your help, um, asking them to think back um, in, in their HS, you know, when they first got their HS, where did they first get it? And what's the second site they got it? And what's the time lag between the first and second site? And what about the third site? Kind of giving a timeline of the progression, but also kind of a map on a geographic location. And what we found was quite interesting. We, from people, other people's research, we know that HS tend to be more common in the front of the body in women, kind of like the breast and groin folds. And they tend to be more common in the back of the body in men, kind of like the buttock and the uh, areas around the, um, the anus. And what we found is that uh, the distribution in terms of initial onset, like the first site the HS is involved is quite similar between the cohort that we study and men and women. So about 32 to 35% of both men and women will have their initial site being the armpit. About 20% will be um, the buttock and the groin area. But night, about 18 to 19% will be in between the thighs. Now that's like almost a quote unquote atypical area. It's not really a quote growing fold or, you know, under the arm. So that's very shocking. Like almost one out of five people will have that as the initial site, right? And so that, that, that's really um, important for us to remember. So those are the three sites that we should check in young folks. Under the arms, but slash groin and in between the thighs, and we should be able to cover majority of the areas that are involved. Um, in addition to the onset, we also kind of looked at the other atypical or not intertrigenous sites. And we found that many people actually have involvement behind the ears in the abdominal folds, and um, they often have more than one area of involvement and that progresses, that distribution kind of changes depending on um, whether it's the first site of onset, second or third. And that paper um, is now published and available online. It has kind of cool graphics that my student did and a chart to look at the timeline and anatomical distribution. Yes, and you sent over a copy of the uh, the little image, so we'll, we'll go ahead and link that too in the description, um, so that people can see that graphic that they put together, which is really nice and and shows all of that. And as a parent who has a child with HS, um, unfortunately, I appreciate that to kind of help guide parents as to where to go first, um, because kids don't typically want to talk about it, especially if their parent has it and they know that that's coming. I think sometimes that can be a difficult conversation for them to have. Um, so thank you to help kind of educate parents on where to check for their kids first too, even if you're trying to be sneaky about <laughs> how to do that. Um, um. That's interesting because um, we talk about the atypical areas. Um, then, but there's also research helping us to identify um, the presence of HS by asking one single question. And that was shocking when we first learned. And this question, if asked, actually has ni over 90% sensitivity and specificity of getting HS. So it's like good at detection and picking cases up. And also like if you think that there's, if the answer is yes to this question, then very, very likely the person has HS. And this question, I mean, I'm not saying it verbatim, but um, I'm now having uh, our schedulers ask that question to kind of help patients get filtered into the HS clinic. So the question is, in the past six months, have you had recurrent, and that's defined by more than two to three times, uh, painful boils in the following areas, underarms, below the breast or groin? That's it, period. 
Wow. That seems like a really simple question, yeah. right? <laughs> and yes, it catches only the typical sites, but that's enough to capture uh, 90% sensitivity or higher. And I feel like my colleagues um, need to ask that more. That's like, I just said that in maybe like, what, like less than 10 seconds, but yeah. we have captured so many cases if we ask that more commonly. And that's especially true in uh, our colleagues in primary care, in pediatrics, and um, I will say ob gyne. yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Just that one simple question. And, and yes, it kind yep. of encapsulates everything. That's amazing. Yeah, we definitely need to get that out more for sure. Right. So when a person comes into the clinic and tells my staff, I have HS, I said that person has HS most yeah. likely. <laughs> yes. they, they know. Oh, uh, and it's not something you want to have. So, you know, if uh, if you're saying that that's most likely what you have, then yep. it probably is. Um, right. So let's talk about hair follicles for a second. I think one of the... Um, you know, like you had touched on and we've put out as well that hair follicles, you can have HS anywhere other than soles of your feet, palms of your hand and the pink parts of your lips. Um, I think one of the common misunderstandings is that there has to be an actual hair there for there to be a hair follicle. So can you clarify that for us? Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually just talked about that with some medical students um, on rotation this week. So um I guess when we think about hair follicle, what we're seeing on the skin surface are the openings or pores. Um, that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. What's underneath that pore is kind of a little track or how do you call it? Like a little, um, a two walls and then it goes deep into the skin. And that's typically where the hair sits. The hair will grow from the bottom, comes out of that wall and comes out, right? And then attached to that hair, and we can like post a hair unit sometimes, attached to that hair is an oil gland. So you can see that the skin cells and the hair cells kind of like shed into that tunnel and then the oil also adds to it. So when that gets plugged, you can imagine we get a white head on a black head. And that's um, thought to be the initial, uh, 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 in, like a factor, um, the first step of forming acne and in some cases HS. But that pore doesn't have to have a hair in it. And even if it has a hair in it, it doesn't have to be visible to our naked eye. Um, the hair that you see on my head, these are called terminal hair. Um, they're like mature hair. Um, that's commonly seen on the scalp. Um, our eyebrows, you know, and kind of the um, genital and uh, underarm area, so terminal hair. But there are other kinds of hair, like vellus hair. They're another word for like fuzzy hair. We have peach fuzz, and you may not see peach fuzz. And even, you know, I don't visibly see hair on my arm, but I for sure have hair follicles there. And so the hair unit, the presence of the hair unit, which contains the hair follicle um, and the oil gland, is enough to, um, I guess, be a harbinger or an anatomical site for HS development. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. I think that that's, you know, you look at it and you don't see a hair coming out of it. So you instantly think, oh, I can't have HS there because there's no hair follicle, but really there is just maybe not visible hair. Exactly. Um, so I know we had talked a little bit about kind of what's being done on the clinician side to bring more awareness to, uh, atypical locations. Um, is there anything else you can share on that other than kind of educate yourself as a patient? I know we're working on it on the HS Connect side, HSF and Learn Skin, and everybody's working on it on your end too, to try to get the word out about that. Yeah, um, I think just, you know, if for a person living with HS when they're seeing their clinicians, I will ask the kid by um, letting them, if you know, you don't, they don't mind to do a full skin check in every part because oftentimes, even when the HS is not active or has quote unquote burned out for many years, it can still occur. So um, for example, you know, if the first site is the underarms and it's burned out itself or after surgery um, is no longer a problem, but it's still to get good to get that check, a site checked because um, some of the, um, complications that the most worrisome complications is squamous cell carcinoma, which is a type of skin cancer from chronic non-healing wounds and through scars. And um, so when we're focusing only on active lesions, we may miss an opportunity to catch these more serious consequences. 
Um, and even when things are burned out, we know that it's like grass, it has a little crack, it will grow back. And it's good to kind of work with the clinician to monitor those quiet sites. Yes, and it seems that they're quiet for a limited time and then will always kind of reoccur. So um, that's it's definitely a good thing. And I know every year when I go, I ask for a full skin check as well, just because, well, I'm moly anyway. Um, so I always want to make sure that there's nothing that looks odd, but just to get a kind of baseline of where I am right then um, to make sure that everything's okay and not uh that there's nothing untoward happening so that's very smart I, I wish more of my patients are doing that with their other providers um even with the sinus tracts with the really good medical treatment they're quiet they're no longer draining they may be minimally symptomatic but um, recent research have shown that those tunnels when they're present um, are still very much immunologically active and they are still housing a lot of uh, bacteria that may at one point, at any point, start to cause problems. Yeah, yeah, it, they, they like to lie and wait until a really inopportune time. Yes. They really do, yes, I agree. <laughs> um, so I know when we talk about atypical locations, there's also atypical groups for HS. So, you know, we've always been told that it basically, uh, it comes on at puberty, children uh, are not susceptible, that after menopause, you're, you can't get HS. Men, because in North America, it's, you know, three women to one man. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of men, I think, don't get diagnoses the way that they should because they're being told that it's atypical in men, even though for every three, there is still one. Um, and obviously that differs in other countries as well, as far as the ratio between genders. Um, but how do we help kind of encourage that thinking to go away? And does, we're seeing that it does affect children more than previously thought and that it can affect women after menopause. So what are your thoughts on that? That is the multi-billion dollar question. <laughs> um, I'm so glad you bring that up. I mean, I think epidemiologic studies that looks at, you know, what a certain disease, whom a certain disease affects and how is flawed, right? Because we can look at every individual in each country and in the world. So these epidemiological population-based study is really looking at a small cohort and making an extrapolation on how we think, you know, North America HS distribution is like. So they're really flawed. So if you look at the global HS um, uh, prevalence, it's between one to 4%. But I mean, my population, my patient population is way more than 4%. So am I wrong or is that study flawed? And both is true. Um, and I think um, you will probably agree with me that there's a lot of underdiagnosis and misdiagnosis. Um, so the likely global prevalence is higher than 4%. That's very high. Um, and the most of the epidemiologic study coming out of the westernized culture, um, including us here in North America, would be they mainly affect women of childbearing potential, um, like you and I. And we're missing a lot of groups, like you said, especially men. Um, and that may just also be a social and um, a, a psychosocial component too, that men aren't seeking healthcare as much as women. So they're not being diagnosed and being caught early and being properly managed. Most of the men, when they do present though to their healthcare provider are more advanced than women. Um, so that's really, and you and I talk about this a lot. We really got to get our um, man, men living with it just to come and join the community to empower um, both clinicians and people living with HS alike. But I have seen HS, I mean, when I first started doing this, uh, when someone comes and tells me, I've been having HS since I was two years old, I said, how is that possible? That's before your sex hormones kick in. And I was a skeptic until I've seen it. I mean, I've seen case reports in the literature. I was a skeptic myself and I'm honest. Um, until I've seen a two-year-old in the hospital with HS. And there's genetic components behind that too. And I was a skeptic until um, I thought, well, how can you be in your 70s and 80s and having HS for the first time? Well, guess what? I've seen it. 
And I think that's a flaw that I had initially is that the eyes don't really see what the mind doesn't know, right? Um, we see rare case reports, but until it's present it in front of us, then it becomes a reality. And so um, learning from my own experience early on in my career, I urge my colleagues to be mindful um, that it can develop in any age to anybody. Yes, and we are working on our end as well. Like we just brought on Dominic Giuliano um, to our HS Connect team and he's fantastic and is really working with us on trying to reach the male population. Um, you know, we know also that teens are heavily impacted, um, you know, right at that puberty age. So we're trying to put together a teen support group as well. Um, especially, I mean, I have two kids with HS, so I know that they need support and they're not alone, but because we can hide this usually with where it impacts us, um, we kind of tend to carry it around as our dirty little secret and don't want to tell other people because it isn't, there isn't gla anything glamorous about it. Um, so trying to really work on impacting men coming forward to, like you said, um, and getting them involved in what's going on and getting their voice heard so that maybe we can get some better statistics as well if they're participating in surveys and studies and research. So there's a long We're road to go there. definitely seeing a change because of the work you're doing. We're definitely seeing the change. Um, oh. My male patients come in say that, you know, I've been reading a lot about what the support group said about men. I'm like, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> Good. Yes, we're trying. Um, so let's switch gears and talk about something that is really common in the HS community. And I think we have an opportunity here to kind of get a better understanding of antibiotics and why they are recommended and prescribed for HS. So obviously, you know, before I knew anything about HS, um, I... I thought that it was prescribed because I had some kind of an infection, which now I know is not the case. Um, but can you help us understand more why antibiotics are prescribed and the reason behind that? Yeah, definitely. I'm glad that you bring that up. Um, it's the most commonly asked questions too in my HS clinic. Um, so antibiotic is still currently one of the mainstay treatments for HS. And I think before we go into why, maybe you know, allow me to touch upon you know, what are the causes of HS? And as a clinician, we try to design uh, a treatment toolbox that kind of target all the causes. So HS, at least currently is known is caused by the following factors. One is genetics. Two is too much uh, overactive immune system causing inflammation. So that comes with drainage, pain and swelling and redness. Um, and then there's a hormonal imbalance. And finally, last but not least, an imbalance in the good and bad bacteria. So that's also called dysbiosis or imbalance in the microbiome. So you can see that um, we can only get HS to become better when we have targeted all of these things. We don't have gene therapy yet, let's be real, but um, our lifestyle and the um, treatment that we uh, recommend could potentially change the way our genes are expressed. So even though the code the letter codes can't change, what turns on and off um, can be influenced. So that being said, let's focus on probably inflammation and uh, imbalance between the good and bad. Um, the uh, bacteria, when we see an abscess or an inf a, 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 a inflamed bump, it is sterile. Um, a baseline. It's not an infection. Like if I try to culture a bomb that's covered by our skin, uh, nothing really will grow besides what's normally, like what we call like a normal flora. But when things open, they ulcerate, there's erosions, the, the skin is open, anything's game, right? Everything in the environment can grow on it. And so at that point, there's really no point of checking whether what's growing on it because anything is, is possible. And that's really the most feared um, part because when we have tunnels, they grow this thing called the biofilm. It's a film of bacteria, which is really the main contributor for um, drainage and, and, and malodorous smell and pain. So when we use antibiotics, it has two um, big reasons. One of them is that certain antibiotics can decrease inflammation. Um, even when it does nothing uh, with the, 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 the bacteria itself. 
And two, which is the main thing, is that we try to rebalance the microbiome strategically using certain combinations of bacteria uh, antibiotics. And it really should not, it should never, antibiotics should never be the only treatment for HS, but really to be part of the toolbox um, as these non-antibiotic treatments take effect, such as you know, strategic hormonal therapies in women using biologics if needed and combining with surgical procedures when the time is right. Um, I think you know, antibiotics should also not be a forever treatment. That's very important. We can't just write an antibiotic with doxycycline and see you in six years. Um, it shouldn't be used continuously, continuously either because that will cause bacterial resistance, meaning that means um, the bacteria gets used and gets clever to an antibiotic and it, it doesn't get killed by it anymore. Um, so in some cases we do combine antibiotics um, and that should be rotated. So some of um, for if any of my patients are, you know, on the uh, on the, you know, watching this video, you will know that I probably start with three things. Then three months later, I start with two things. I de-escalate when you're better, and then I go down to one, and then I stop. But if we get worse, we start and we play around. It's always like now we're playing around and then we'll stop when we are in a good place and ready, have a small window for surgical procedures and whatnot. And that is the trick, is to very dynamically change this um, rather than being the sole treatment. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. It does. So, and kind of tagging onto that. So how does it work if, you know, if you're on an antibiotic and then you're switching them around, um, how does it not build up uh, resistance? Is it because it kind of has a break from that antibiotic? Like if you were to go back to it, like you had mentioned, switching them around? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm trying to think about the best analogy in that. If we eat, okay, I really like Big Mac, okay? So if I eat Big Mac every day, I'm gonna get used to Big Mac. It's no longer my thing, right? And that's why I gotta eat fish fill. I'm thinking about, I'm gonna get McDonald's after this. <laughs> That's why after like eating oh, a binge eat on Big Mac, I got to switch to fish, like, you know, I got to switch to a chicken burger or something like that. It's the same for bacteria, you know, like what works for them, um, you know, uh, if we continuously hit it, it's no longer going to work. So when we space it up, they somehow like forget. They're a community like Facebook. They, they, they learn and they transfer this knowledge to each other. It's like, hey, look, um, we've been getting doxycycline a lot, like learn from me, become resistance to it. And then when you switch to something else, they're like, oh, what is this? I don't remember anymore. Um, it, it, it has an effect. And that's why, um, you know, uh, the rotating and combined ones is, uh, it really portends higher efficacy, like it works better and lowers resistance. Okay, that makes perfect sense. That was one of the questions I was like, how does that work? So good to know that we, our bodies are really good at some things and have, a really bad memory in some cases, just like me. So that makes me happy. <laughs> um, as far as one of the other things that comes up quite often in the community is the uh, using zinc and vitamin D. And those things are things that we can obviously do over the counter um, and come up quite common. So can you tell us more about both of those? Yeah, so... Um... A lot of the supplements used in HS was learned from other skin conditions like acne and psoriasis because they've done well in those conditions, people with those conditions. Um, we'll start with the vitamin D maybe. Um, so vitamin D is also called the sunshine vitamin. Um, in our body naturally, it has anti-inflammatory properties. It also increases our body's own ability to fight quote unquote germs. In this case, you know, imbalance in bacteria. Um, and I'll tell you what the research have found. Um, research have found that almost all of people living with HS have a vitamin D deficiency. And we don't exactly know why. I mean, it could be because of low dietary intake, low absorption, even though we're eating enough. And vitamin D requires sunshine to be activated. So like sun has to shine the skin in order to, for active, vitamin D to be activated. So if we're not getting enough normal sunlight, then we don't have active vitamin D. And so uh, there are studies showing that if we uh, re, uh, su supplement vitamin D orally, and when the serum level, go the blood level of vitamin D goes up, HS gets better. 
Um, similar thing is for zinc too. Um, there's a study showing that when uh, people with HS is dosed with zinc, but at higher dose than what's normally seen in kind of like that, you know, women's daily or men daily, the multivitamin combo basically much higher, much higher doses, it can improve HS. And that's where it came from, you know, um, it, they act as an adjunctive treatment to you know conventional prescription treatments and life, lifestyle modifications. And as far as that goes, so is it something that's recommended to have your levels checked by, for vitamin D or and or zinc, or is that something that isn't really possible? Um, you know, because we hear sometimes. Sorry, my dog is pushing the computer. Um, we hear sometimes people, you know, saying that they we need to be careful for mineral toxicity. Um, so kind of help us understand that a little bit more. Yeah, so it is possible to check the blood level of zinc or vitamin D and many other, I, I call them micronutrients. Micronutrients are basically vitamin, vitamins and minerals. Um, that being said, the commercial labs that are available mainly check the blood level. So we draw the blood and then fancy test spits out a number and it gives you like a range, right? Um, the challenge is that the blood level doesn't really correlate with the functional status of zinc in our body. So um, we can have a normal or even above normal level of vitamin D or zinc in our blood, but at the tissue and the body level, like the functional level, it's not doing enough. And that is a whole nother story on like why that is. Everyone has a different reason why their functional zinc or vitamin D status is low. Um, for example, Serum zinc is not really reliable and that's widely known. The WHO actually has multiple papers looking at this. Um, and you know, in kids, when we look at zinc, we actually sometimes use their hair to look at the zinc level in their hair. So that tells us that we haven't really found the best test to test it yet. Um, I will tell you um, from my personal practice, um, majority of my patients that I do check at baseline are those who don't really have any risk factors for vitamin D deficiency. Unfortunately, as you know, many people living with HS aren't able to be more active and be outdoors a lot. And there might be some absorption issues too that we haven't really thought about because the gut and skin um, access is really much well, like closely connected. So I used to check, frankly, every patient uh, before I start zinc and vitamin D supplementation. And their levels are low, especially vitamin D, like it's like super low. So if you're lower than 30, then it's considered low. And many people are much lower than that. Um, and myself included, I, my vitamin D living in Chicago was so low, I didn't even know how I was functioning. And, but I will check if I, I will check the level after I start supplementing high dose zinc and vitamin D. Um, because that's a way to monitor the, the response to treatment. If I'm seeing the blood level return like higher, that means you know, if everything else is going correctly, um, the HS should improve too. Okay, perfect. And then what do you recommend? Um, is there a topical zinc product that people can use or is it something that just would be taken orally as a, a zinc supplement? Yeah, that's a great question. So zinc supplement, if taken orally supplements, they often have zinc blank because they're like organic, there's like a little chelation with it. And the most common one that we find is zinc gluconate, sorry, and zinc picolinate. Um, picolinate is a little bit harder to find and it seems to be a little bit more expensive than gluconate. But um, in my patients experience, they tend to be better tolerated in terms of less GI upset, less stomach burning, less nausea, less vomiting. Um, topical zinc, on the other hand, is really kind of like zinc oxide. It's the sunscreen and the diaper paste. It acts as a kind of like a protective barrier, and that can be helpful for areas that are affecting HS to, you know, so it's not skin on skin. Same for why we use diaper creams in, on babies. Um, yeah, so um, zinc sulfate is the other one that one can probably see as a supplement taken by mouth. That one doesn't tend to have as good of a bioavailability, meaning when you take it, it doesn't get distributed well into the blood and into the tissue. So that's not something I typically recommend. And that one typically have more GI side effects as well. 
And then is there anything else that people can do when they're taking zinc to try to minimize those side effects, like taking them with food or not with food? Yeah, everyone's different. I'll be very honest with you. Some people, I, I joke around, say, you guys have the stomach of steel. Like you can load everything with them. And they're like, hmm, I'm fine. But you know, if you're like me, anything can upset my stomach. We have to be super cautious. So there's, there's a few things that, you know, we can try. Um, one, you know, uh, over-the-counter zinc doesn't really come in like 90 or 100 milligram horse pills. They are often smaller, you know, like 30 milligrams is probably one of the bigger ones I've seen. So that's actually to our advantage. Don't take all three at once. Do morning, um, you know, lunch and evening. So you break it up a little bit. Um, that's one option. And also work with the, uh, your clinician to see whether you can space out other, you know, stomach upsetting medicines like doxycycline is one of them, metformin is another one of them, and that notorious rifampin, the antibiotic, um, is already upsetting enough. So if there's any way to design what my resident and I call the medication march for the day, that will be really helpful. Like we give them exactly when to take what to minimize this issue. So. Um, you know, we would do like rifampin during noon and six, and then the zinc and copper during nine and three. So really space them out and incorporate kind of the small snack slash meal with each intake um, has been helpful, I think. And is there, as far as taking zinc supplements, um, is there like a duration that you should not take them longer than, or is this something that you could do forever? Yeah. So I think, um, if you look at the studies, they're typically like about three months, um, not many long-term follow-up is done. And probably because these are prescription medications and the funding doesn't allow them to do it. I think when we worry about toxicity is really the cumulative dose, meaning, um, what dose you're taking every day times how many days you're taking it. And it also um, is influenced by how our body clears it. Um, so, you know, anything frankly lower than uh, 90 milligrams to 100 milligrams is not, for zinc at least, um, we're not at the anti-inflammatory dose that's enough to, to, to help HS and acne. Um, so that's why taking a daily multivitamin with zinc is not enough. Um, and I will say the best analogy I can give my patients is, you know, over-the-counter ibuprofen tablets are 200 milligrams. They're like these baby taps. And it works super well um, for, you know, menstrual cramps and maybe a headache. Just like how over-the-counter low-dose zinc should work well for daily supplementation. But for ibuprofen, if we have joint pain or we have like, you know, herniated disc, we got to take 800 milligrams three times a day. That's a huge mega dose, like horse pills to swallow. But unless we get to that dose, it doesn't have anti-inflammatory effects. So similar can be seen in zinc. So we got to take up more than 90 to get that anti-inflammatory effect. That makes perfect sense. And thank you for the analogy. I think that it really helps. Um, and then we'll list on in the description as well, the, um, the different zinc supplements that you had mentioned and which one um, you find to be best so that people can have that information and what, uh, how many milligrams per day and all of that good stuff. And then also obviously the options of taking it with food or without food and kind of trying to find what works best for them. Again, this is not medical advice. Um, this is just something that, that Dr. She has discussed with us. Um, so we are not condoning or telling you to go ahead and take these medications. Um, but if you are interested in, in doing this on your own, we want to make sure that you're informed. So, um, and one of the other questions I had back to antibiotics, I forgot about this question. So I know in a lot of cases, um, before you can try another medication uh, like Humira or anything like that, insurance is requiring people to go through the rigmarole of the antibiotics. Is that what you find in most cases? Thanks, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, unfortunately. Um, it also depends on the insurance, the payer, right? The insurance payer. Uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, most of my patients who have HS are for, on a federal um, payer uh, healthcare insurance, and we're talking about Medicaid and Medicare. Unfortunately, um, 
probably 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, um, it will require uh, compliance and usage of a topical antibiotic like clindamycin. Um, sometimes I would be asked to do a hormonal modulator. By the way, none of these are truly approved for HS by the FDA. Nevertheless, we use commonly. Um, so they will require a hormonal modulator like a oral birth combined uh, pills, contraception pills for women, um, or maybe spironolactone for women. And they will require the usage of an oral antibiotic for three months straight. And sometimes, this is the other part, they will even require me to give a systemic vitamin A like Accutane. Um, the generic is isotretinoin or acetretin, which is zoriatin, uh, or even methotrexate, which uh, is a medicine that we use for HS on top of other things. So you can see that we are told that our patients must have tried, have been compliant and have failed these medications before they're eligible for a biologic medication like adalimumab. Well, do I think it's the best route? No, I don't think so. Because, you know, if I see a moderate to severe person with HS, I know that all the aforementioned ones is not going to get to where we are, nor would it be very appropriate to put somebody on a birth control pill when they have a history of clots or migraines, et cetera, et cetera. That being said, there is research showing that the combined use of an oral antibiotic like doxycycline with adalimumab can potentiate, meaning it, that the combined effect is better than using antibiotic alone or using adalimumab alone. So in that case, um, it's common that I will start, keep the patient on um, a good and safe antibiotic regimen while I start adalimumab. And then once we're in remission and find the right tool, get them off antibiotics if possible. Perfect. Yes. And from, I understand the, the hoops that must be jumped through. Um, but as a patient advocate, if you do, if you are further than stage two or, or you're in stage three and, you know, you go to the dermatologist and the, you're being told that you need to start at square one and, you know, with these treatment measures that will most likely be ineffective for you, um, reach out to us, please, because we do have some ways that we can help navigate through this um, and help you with your dermatologist as well and, and figure out a way to kind of uh, move through this and through the channels that you have to go through. So um, I know as somebody who didn't go to the derm for about 10 years and then went, it was like, I wanted to just laugh in their face when they said that we should go on doxy. Um, you know, as a severe stage three, you're just like, you, you gotta be kidding me. Like I have to start back at square one. Like, um, so we know how frustrating it can be to do that. And that you, that as a physician, your hands are tied, um, you know, that you have to work through all of those, um, all of those other medications and other options first. So we know that it, it's not a preference thing for you guys for sure, but we understand the, the trial and error before you get to the next stage or the next step in meds. So. Yeah, really well put Brantley. I think another tip that I could give is, um, it's not a lot of times that you must very recently have tried these medications. So that's important to keep a good log of what medicine you have tried. And so the doctor can document that in the note. If you, even if you have tried say doxycycline three years ago, um, tell them how long you've tried it and whether it worked or not. And that's enough sometimes to have checked the box and have shown that it was ineffective. Um, another point I wanna just make really quickly is that um, HS is a disease where we can have to do medication stacking and uh, treatment stacking. So likely just even if we get to the biologic, like adalimumab, that may not be enough. We still have to go back to kind of the therapeutic ladder, the lower part of the therapeutic ladder to build. And everything we do is to create a synergy so we can have the best outcome before we start to kind of take things off. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a tricky thing. And we were talking the other day about how um, one of the hard parts about it too, is that no matter what you do, it's like a three month, um, you know, you kind of have to do the time to figure out if it's going to work first. And so it's what you wish that it was something that you could just, you know, 
take your Humira injection and then miraculously the next day, you know, you felt so much better and everything was great. Um, but it, it, there's a lot of time that's devoted to, uh, taking medications and seeing if things work and giving them a try. Um, so I think that can be a really frustrating part too, for HS, especially because it can be so painful that you just want it to be resolved or in remission as quickly as possible. So keeping in mind that, you know, it's not, it's not the physicians just saying, oh, just come back in three months. It's, you know, that's how long you have to give it to work sometimes. And I think, especially with an antibiotic, because people think that it's being taken because of an infection, you're expecting the typical, you know, I'll swallow my horse pills and for seven to 10 days, and then I'll be better. But that's really not what's going on underneath. So just keeping in mind that it does take time for these things to work. Thank you. That's better put than what I that's <laughs> better than what I have said, really. Um, it's, it's really a lot of patience and a lot of adherence. And we are your partners. We are cheerleaders actually. And really we want to do everything we can to help you succeed um, in finding the right plan that's short-term and long-term for y'all. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Shi, thank you so much for uh, talking with me today about this. I know we always start out with like one topic and then it just goes into multiple topics. It becomes very difficult to name what our article or our interviews are because <laughs> it's like starts out with this, but then there's this list of things as well. So thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, we will include a bunch of information in the description of the video and we'll also put it up on our website at hsconnect.org. Always a pleasure. Thank you. See you next Thanks. time. Have a good day. You too.